we have just sung these words, and they are our prayer before you. We pray, O Lord, forgive us if we have uttered these words just in our lips and not in our hearts, because truly we need you every hour. We need you for the remainder of this hour as we come to your word. I need you, O Lord, that I might preach your word faithfully and truthfully and humbly and boldly. And we need your word that you would do a mighty work in our hearts and in our lives. And so we come asking out of our great sense of need that you would bless us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. We come this morning to Genesis chapter 39 as we continue with our series we've been in for some time now. And Lord willing, we will make our way through the end of Genesis by the time we get to a summer break. Genesis chapter 39, I'll be reading all 23 verses. Now Joseph had been brought down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the guard, an Egyptian, had bought him from the Ishmaelites who had brought him down there. The Lord was with Joseph, and he became a successful man, and he was in the house of his Egyptian master. His master saw that the Lord was with him, and that the Lord caused all that he did to succeed in his hands. So Joseph found favor in his sight and attended him. And he made him overseer of his house and put him in charge of all that he had. From the time that he made him overseer in his house and over all that he had, the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. The blessing of the Lord was on all that he had in house and field. So he left all that he had in Joseph's charge. And because of him, he had no concern about anything but the food he ate. Now, Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. And after a time, his master's wife cast her eyes on Joseph and said, lie with me. But he refused and said to his master's wife, behold, because of me, my master has no concern about anything in the house and he has put everything that he has in my charge. He is not greater in this house than I am, nor has he kept back anything from me except you because you are his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? And as she spoke to Joseph day after day, he would not listen to her, to lie beside her or to be with her. But one day when he went into the house to do his work and none of the men of the house was there in the house, she caught him by his garment saying, lie with me. But he left the garment in her hand and fled and got out of the house. And as soon as she saw that he had left his garment in her hand and had fled out of the house, she called to the men of her household and said to them, See, he has brought among us a Hebrew to laugh at us. He came in to me to lie with me, and I cried out with a loud voice. And as soon as he heard that I lifted up my voice and cried out, he left his garment beside me and fled and got out of the house. And she laid up his garment by her until his master came home. And she told him the same story, told him the same story, saying, the Hebrew servant whom you have brought among us came in to me to laugh at me. But as soon as I lifted up my voice and cried, he left his garment beside me and fled out of the house. As soon as his master heard the words that his wife spoke to him, this is the way your servant treated me, his anger was kindled. And Joseph's master took him and put him into the prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined, and he was there in prison. But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him steadfast love gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And the keeper of the prison put Joseph in charge of all the prisoners who were in the prison. Whatever was done there, he was the one who did it. The keeper of the prison paid no attention to anything that was in Joseph's charge because the Lord was with him. And whatever he did, the Lord made it succeed. Dominus vobiscum et cum spiritu tuo. That's your Latin test for this morning. You can ask your children. They can help you maybe. That Latin is the beginning of the preface to the communion prayer in the traditional liturgy in the Western church. It's found in the Catholic church, Anglican, Lutheran, and many Presbyterian forms of worship. Dominis vobiscum 
means the Lord be with you. Et cum spiritu tuo means and with thy spirit or a newer translations and also with you. The Lord be with you and also with you. Whether those words sound familiar to you or if you've never been in a church with those words, if you've never been in church at all, they hit upon something simple yet profound. That's a reason that in many churches they have been said for almost 2,000 years. As trite as it may seem, there are few things more profound and more wonderful And more amazing that you could say to someone than simply, the Lord be with you. The big idea in this passage in Genesis 39, and I hope you have your Bibles open so you can follow along. The big idea in this passage is easy to find. Maybe you noticed it already. The Lord was with Joseph. That big theme bookends the story. It's there at the beginning, and in the middle we have the story of the temptation from Potiphar's wife, and then it's there again at the end. So look at verse 2. The Lord was with Joseph, and he became a successful man. Verse 3. His master saw that the Lord was with him, and the Lord caused all that he did to succeed in his hands. That's at the beginning. Then at the end of the story, verse 21. But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him steadfast love and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And then the end of verse 23, the Lord was with him and whatever he did, the Lord made it succeed. So it's pretty clear what the big idea is in this passage. It is not about how any dream will do. I was, uh, after the sermon two weeks ago, been still humming around or singing a few bars to uh, Joseph in the amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat. And my wife said, you're not singing that again this week. No, I'm not, but it's still in my head. Uh, I'm not going to have a a, a new song, the Calypso song, and just, you know, greatest hits throughout the rest of the series. But this story is obviously not about any dream will do, or you are what you feel. The chapter is about God's purpose to show favor to Joseph as the recipient of his promises and the purveyor of his blessings. The recipient of his promises and the purveyor or the channel of his blessings. This story is in direct fulfillment to all that God had promised to Abraham way back in Genesis chapter 12. Of course, it's not the fullness of everything that God has promised, but it is in direct fulfillment. Genesis 12, 3, God told Abram, I will bless those who bless you, and through you, all the nations, or all the families of the earth, shall be blessed. We're seeing this play out in real time in chapter 39. Look at verse 5. From the time that he made him overseer in his house and over all that he had, the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. It couldn't be any clearer. That's an explicit fulfillment of the promise to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12. Yes, through you, Joseph, descendant of Abraham, the nations of the earth, here the Egyptians, are being blessed. Verse 6, he left all that he had in Joseph's charge, and because of him, he had no concern about anything. That was true with Potiphar, and then later it's true with the keeper of the prison in verse 23. The keeper of the prison paid no attention to anything that was in Joseph's charge because the Lord was with him. So Joseph is the means of great blessing to the household of Potiphar, and then to this keeper of the prison and all that he is in charge of. Joseph is so faithful, he's so good at what he does, that these men in authority say, I don't even need to worry about anything. I get a little more vacay time. I get to have a little, I can read my books and watch some Netflix because Joseph is doing such a good job here, I don't even have to think about it. This is part of what's been happening in the larger narrative 
of Genesis. Over and over we see God blessing his people and we see God blessing those who come in close contact with his people, blessing those who bless them, cursing those who curse them. Now that's good, it also means that we need to be careful lest we turn this incident about Joseph and we expect that this is indubitably going to be true of all of us. I could see how some preacher might take this in a direction to say, ah, you are going to have success in whatever you do. And if you just believe God and his promises, you're going to have success in life and you're going to climb ladders and everything's going to go well for you. That would not be a fair implication. God gave Joseph success in everything, so surely he will give me success in everything. Nevertheless, let's not be too quick to distance ourselves and say, well, that was nice, must have been helpful for Joseph. There are a number of observations we can make as we reflect on this big theme. Remember the big theme, the Lord was with Joseph. The Lord was with him. We can reflect on what does this mean, this theme, the Lord is with you. What does this mean for us? Let's look at four ways, four observations from this theme in this passage and then apply to our lives. Four reflections this morning. Number one, this theme, the Lord is with you, should make us grateful when looking at our successes and humble when looking at the successes of others. Should make us grateful when we see our own successes, humble when looking at the successes of others. So think about your successes, whether you feel like you've had lots of them in life or you're still looking for a few more. Think about Joseph. It's true, he was faithful. The the success that God gave him didn't come through Joseph just sitting around doing nothing. He was gifted. He was hardworking. It seems that he had a knack for administration, for order, for managing people and processes. So often we, we think about those who maybe have very public gifts of speaking or music or other things. But here we have someone who behind the scenes was absolutely amazing at making sure that everything ran smoothly and efficiently. And ultimately that success was from the Lord. Yes, Joseph had abilities that he used, but it could not be clearer. We saw at the beginning and at the end, the main point is not, wow, Joseph was gifted. The main point is God was with him and gave him success. How do you look at the successes in your life? What you have, what you've accomplished, You may think about yourself and you have degrees. Do you have good kids? Do you have a lovely home? Do you have a nice job? Do you have wonderful friends? Do people largely respect you, look up to you? Do you have wealth? Do you have career satisfaction and a good job that's going somewhere? Whatever sort of success that you have, do you look at that as I did it, I worked hard, or my, oh my, God has been so kind to me. There's that passage in Deuteronomy chapter 8 that's speaking to God's people before they enter the promised land, but it's saying what they need to remember when they get into the promised land. Because the Lord says to his people, look, you're going to get into the promised land someday, And you're going to look around and you're going to have fabulous vineyards and you're going to have an abundant harvest and you're going to have homes and you're going to have cities and you're going to be tempted to think, I did it. I did it my way. My hands put this together. Remember where they are. They're wandering around in the wilderness, punished for their sins for 40 years, but they're on the cusp of entering into the promised land. And the reason they'll get the promised land is because God is going to knock down the walls of Jericho. God is going to scatter their enemies. God is going to, by miraculous work of his hand, give them this land. And he says, years later, when you're enjoying the harvest 
and your kids and grandkids are around and you're home, you're going to be tempted to forget me and forget what I did for you. And that word to Israel is a word of warning that God needs to give us every generation, especially we who have thousands and thousands upon times more wealth and prosperity than they could ever dream of in ancient Israel. The temptation to think that the reason everybody else doesn't have it is because they just didn't work as hard, they weren't as good, they weren't as smart, they didn't play by all the rules, this is what I've earned. Of course, Proverbs talk a lot about saving and thrift and honesty and working hard and the dangers if you don't. But let us be grateful for our successes because ultimately they have come from the Lord's hand. I wonder if you really believe that, if I really believe that. It also means that we should be humble when we look at the successes of others. I actually think that this is the harder part of the equation. It's hard enough to look at all we have, but you know, on a good day we can say, oh, Wow, God, you have been so gracious. Why should I have the, these, these kids or grandkids and loved ones around me and I should have this home and you've been so kind to me? Maybe we can do that. Harder is when we don't have as much as we would like or think we deserve. And it seems like everybody else on Instagram is living their best life now. How is that happening? I remember earlier in ministry, and I say earlier, not that my heart's probably ever rid of these things, but I hope I've grown in some ways. But earlier in ministry in particular, I remember looking in frustration. Of course, I wouldn't say it out loud, but it was there in my heart and the Lord knew. Some frustration, some dismay to look at other churches that seem to be just growing by leaps and bounds. In my mind, they seem sort of fluffy. I remember touring, you know, seeing one of these churches that had a reputation for just growing and exploding, and lots of people were talking about it and going to it, and uh, I was just, I don't know, I was talking to the pastor or something, and I was walking through the church, and they're showing me their sweet children's ministry section, and it had like Xboxes in every room. I'm not even kidding. I just thought, and this is the church that's growing? And look at the other ones, and I have this little thought in my heart, God, if I get to heaven and I found out it really was the fog machine, <laughs> really was turning the amp up to 11, that was the secret, oh, it's going to be frustrating, because it was one thing to deal with no or very slow growth and my own church, another one to think, well, they're not, their worship isn't very thoughtful, their sermons aren't very profound, but they're growing. Since then, I've had many occasions to see other pastors who don't have some of the opportunities I've had, and I think, that brother is a better pastor than me. That, that brother deserves more than what I've received. You know what? can be more difficult than the hate of our enemies, the success of our friends. It's hard to see our friends who seem to be having everything going right for them. What, what, what would the brother, this is part of what got Joseph in trouble. The brothers were jealous of him. If they could see him now, it'd be, oh, Joseph again, always with Joseph. Everything always works out for Joseph. Well, the Lord was with him. Sometimes you don't have an explanation beyond that. I don't know why. The Lord just chose to be with him. The Lord chose to give him success. The Lord chose to bless that family. The Lord chose to bless that church. The Lord chose to bless that, prosper that business or that Ministry. The Lord has his ways and his reasons, and we don't always know why. He was with Joseph, and he gave him success. So be grateful for whatever successes you have, humble for the ones that you don't. Here's the second 
observation, reflection as we think on this theme. This theme, God is with you, does not mean our circumstances will automatically or immediately change just because he is with us. For someone that is so blessed by God, apparently, Joseph has not had a lot of things go right for him. He ends this chapter in bondage once again because someone has lied about him once again. This is supposed to be the one who has God with him. He's in prison. In fact, there are a number of striking parallels between chapter 37 and chapter 39 that scream to us the same thing is happening again to Joseph. Think about it. In both chapters, 37 and 39, Joseph is the favorite of the head of the household. He's he's Jacob's favorite. He's Potiphar's favorite. In both chapters, Jacob is then given a privileged position. Jacob says, I want you to go check on your brothers. Potiphar says, I want you to go. You're going to check on, you're going to watch over all the other slaves. In both chapters, Joseph has his outer garment stripped away and that article of clothing becomes the lie that seals his fate. Chapter 37 the robe of many colors stripped away, dipped in blood. They go home. They say, sorry, dad, he's been torn by wild beasts. Here, it's his outer garment, his cloak, taken from him by Potiphar's wife. And then when the husband comes home, aha, she brings it out. Here it is. And again, it's the article of clothing, the deceit that seals his fate. In both chapters, he ends up in bondage because... He was loyal and obedient to his master. He was loyal to his father, Jacob. He did what he told him to do. He went out at a distance of some 50 or 60 miles and found his brothers. And because of his loyalty to his master, he ends up sold to Ishmaelite traders. Here, because of his great loyalty to Potiphar, faithful in all his house, faithful not to sleep with his wife, he ends up again in bondage. And in both chapters... It is in the pit that he is condemned, and it is in the pit that he finds his deliverance. In fact, we'll see in the chapters ahead, same word for pit earlier and prison, same Hebrew word. Chapter 37, his condemnation, he ends up in this cistern, in this pit, but it's from that pit that he will be sold off, and he will be delivered. Here in chapter 39, he ends up in a different pit of prison, his condemnation, and yet from this pit again, he will find his deliverance. Despite the promise of blessing and the reassurance of God's presence, at this moment in Joseph's life, it's deja vu all over again. Didn't this just happen? Loyal to my master, Faithful, privileged, work hard, betrayed, lied about, end up in a pit. Same thing. Just because the Lord was with him did not mean his circumstances in that moment were everything he wanted them to be. And so it is with us. Just because you can say the Lord is with me, the Lord be with you, is not a magic wand to change all of your circumstances. You may still be in the pit. You may still be in the prison doesn't change everything immediately. Here's the third theme, and remember there's four, and we're going to spend the most time on this one. So this theme, the Lord be with you, here's the third reflection. This theme does not mean we will not face temptation. So we've seen it doesn't mean your circumstances is going to automatically, immediately change. Here we see it doesn't mean you won't face very profound temptation. This is the bulk of the chapter, so we need to spend some time here. 